At the dawn of the 19th century, a host of outsiders battled over the fate of Egypt. In 1798, Napoleon laid siege to the northern coast and occupied the city of Cairo. Just three years later, the British Navy destroyed the French fleet and drove Napoleon's army out of the land of the pharaohs. Not interested in ruling the country themselves, the British withdrew from Cairo and left its fate to non-European combatants. Chief among these were the Mamluks the descendants of warrior slaves owned by Muslim rulers throughout the Mediterranean and Near East. Conquered by the Ottomans in the 16th century, the Mamluks viewed the sudden power vacuum as an opportunity to reassert their diminished authority in Egypt. In order to prevent this from happening, Constantinople sent a military commander by the name of Muhammad Ali to quell the Mamluk uprising. Ali, like most of the Ottoman elite, did not look, speak, or dress in a way that would be familiar to the majority Arab population of most Middle Eastern states today. In fact, he was an Albanian, born in a town that is today located within the borders of Greece. In 1801, he arrived in Egypt and attempted to end the civil war that had erupted in the wake of the withdrawal of French and British forces. In 1811, after ten years of bloody battles, shrewd negotiations, and ruthless massacres, Muhammad Ali emerged triumphant. Though he never formally broke away from the Ottoman Empire, for the next 38 years Ali ruled Egypt as a self-declared pasha and paid little more than lip service to Ottoman sovereignty. The dynasty he founded would rule Egypt until 1952. In the years after taking power, however, the most important tasks on the pasha's agenda included the fiscal, military, and political modernization of Egypt. These goals, if achieved, could ensure him the resources necessary to prevent the return of any other distant army into his newly acquired realm. One of the first reforms attempted by the new pasha was to increase the agricultural yield of his subjects with the hope of filling his coffers with additional tax revenue that such an increase would bring. For this task, he sought out European scientific expertise. In 1815, just four years after seizing power, Muhammad Ali sent one of his agents to the tiny island of Malta, just off the southern coast of Sicily, in order to scout for talent. He soon met the acquaintance of one Giovanni Belzoni. Belzoni, then 37 years old, had already lived a most interesting life. Born just outside of Venice to a poor family, Belzoni eventually found his way to Rome, where he studied the science of hydraulics and supported himself by selling religious talismans. Hoping to utilize his engineering skills, Belzoni fled the approach of Napoleon's armies in Italy and looked for work in the burgeoning industrial economies of Northern Europe. But work was scarce, and only one place offered reliable wages, the British stage. Soon billed as the Great Belzoni, the six-foot-seven Italian was marketed to the public as a novelty act, one who was capable of lifting eleven men at once. Occasionally, he also managed to find a use for his hydraulic talents, helping to recreate naval battles and spurting fountains on stage. In 1815, looking to expand his horizons, Belzoni left England and set off toward Constantinople, the theatrical mecca of the Muslim world. During a stopover, Belzoni bumped into Muhammad Ali's agent in Malta. He presented Belzoni with a tantalizing proposal. Would he be interested in being rewarded for his brain rather than for his brawn. Muhammad Ali, Belzoni learned, was willing to reward anyone who could invent a mechanical water wheel capable of pumping water from the Nile River to distant fields without the use of human labor. Belzoni, eager to return to what he regarded as his true calling, hydraulics, accepted the challenge and immediately set sail for Egypt. Once in Cairo, Belzoni found the Pasha to be a most enlightened man one serious about reform and congenial enough to allow the royal fingers to be shocked during an experiment. 
Unfortunately for Belzoni, however, the Pasha was not impressed with his water wheel. It was too expensive, in need of too many repairs, and only marginally more efficient than the plentiful human labor at his disposal. Disappointed, Belzoni now wondered how else he might make a living in Egypt. Henry Salt, the British consul in Cairo, provided the answer. Much like Lord Elgin in Athens, Salt was eager to turn his temporary political influence into permanent cultural capital. Unlike Elgin, however, no one back in Europe yet regarded Egyptian antiquities as a form of fine art on par with that of ancient Greece and Rome. In this respect, Salt and Belzoni would blaze a pioneering trail. In the year 1816, Salt approached the despondent Belzoni with a tantalizing proposition. Perhaps the Pasha didn't want his water wheel, he said, but Salt would love to harness Belzoni's hydraulic and engineering skills to transport a seven-ton block of exquisitely carved granite lying on the banks of the Nile River at Luxor, in Upper Egypt. The French had apparently tried to remove it for their collection in the Louvre, but had failed to push it even just two miles to the banks of the Nile. Here was a golden opportunity for the British to once again upstage the French. Belzoni accepted the assignment. He was told to spare no expense or trouble in transporting the head as speedily as possible up the Nile to Alexandria. The head itself was described as being of large dimensions, with the face being, quote, quite perfect and very beautiful, and the surface colored by a mix of blackish and reddish granite and covered with hieroglyphics on its shoulders. They named it the Memnon Head, in reference to a mythical Ethiopian king alleged by Homer to have participated in the legendary Battle of Troy. The selection of this name reflected the belief among Europeans of the time that nothing so exquisite could possibly have been created by a people located outside of the Greek tradition. Once in Luxor, Belzoni quickly located the head. He found it, to use his own words, quote, near the remains of its body and chair, with its face upwards, and apparently smiling on me at the thought of being taken to England. Smiling or not, the Memnum head, under Belzoni's direction, made it safely up the Nile. Invigorated by the prospect of success in his new vocation, Belzoni proceeded to search high and low for exotic antiquities capable of enticing the elites of Europe to open their pocketbooks. Though Belzoni attempted to couch his activities in the language of scholarship, often referring to what he insisted on calling his, quote, researches, his was a scarcely veiled money-making enterprise. Of the portable antiquities he removed from Egypt, only the Memnum head would eventually end up at the British Museum. Belzoni's other discoveries were sold or exhibited for far more baldly commercial purposes. The alabaster coffin of Seti I, a pharaoh who ruled during the 13th century BC, was retrieved by Belzoni in 1817 from an elaborate tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Several years later, Belzoni sold thousands of tickets to a hugely profitable panorama in London that contained his own reconstruction of the interior of the tomb, with the sarcophagus itself taking center stage. In addition, the delivery of an obelisk from the island temple of Philae in Upper Egypt, dated to the 2nd century before Christ, was commissioned for delivery by Belzoni in 1821 to the country estate of William John Banks in Dorset, England, where it still stands today. Belzoni also dug out the two rock colossi at Abu Simbel and reopened the long-forgotten entrance to the temple. Yet once he realized that few portable antiquities lay inside, he quickly abandoned the site. In the six years from 1815 to 1821, the expeditions of Giovanni Belzoni in Egypt revealed the remarkable degree to which new scientific knowledge, indispensable for the industrial development then overtaking Western Europe, could also be put to use in the burgeoning field of archaeology. After all, Belzoni was not a scholar. Outside of the theater, his only marketable skills were derived from the science of hydrology, the ability to manipulate water in ways unintended by nature. And yet this was enough to ensure him an exclusive audience with the Pasha of Egypt and make possible a profitable second act in the discovery and removal of cultural artifacts. Much like the military engineers who oversaw the first systematic excavations at Pompeii, Belzoni learned firsthand 
just how indispensable the possession of European scientific knowledge could be for those willing to turn it toward the accumulation of cultural capital for wealthy European patrons. As long as Europe maintained its newfound monopoly on scientific progress, its agents in the field would invariably find themselves more favorably positioned than any other indigenous rivals to claim, remove, and exhibit cultural treasures from foreign lands. Wealthy European elites provided the money, powerful ambassadors and consuls provided the access, and the historical Indiana Jones provided the means. In 1823, on the eve of a new expedition into West Central Africa, Giovanni Belzoni died of dysentery. He was 45 years old. Just one year earlier, the French scholar Jean-Francois Champollion deciphered the first hieroglyphs. From this point on, Anyone who took an interest in the history of Egypt could choose between two modes of engagement, one pioneered by Belzoni and one pioneered by Champollion. Please join us next time as we explore the origins of these two modes, Egyptology and Egyptomania, in Episode 6 of Indiana Jones in History. <laughs> <laughs>